let's go to the Lord in prayer, okay? Father, we just come before you. And Lord God, we do lift our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our brothers, our sisters, Lord God, our aunts and uncles, our families, as Esther said, Lord God. We just need that closeness. We need that oneness, Lord God. And whatever it is in our lives, Lord, and everybody has stuff, like they said. Everybody has stuff that they are fighting the battle, Lord God, and, and sometimes we can't seem to let go of stuff. Well, today, Lord God, we let go of it. We want to let go of some of the things that hinder us from that closeness, not only with our loved ones, but with you, Father. Now, I pray today is just that beginning, Lord God. And maybe the, the, something hinders it between... Us here, individuals here. Well, we need to get rid of that today, Lord God. We need to get rid of that. And Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, whatever it is, if there's stuff in me, Lord God, not if, but there is, I pray, Lord God, that you would just help me. Help me, Lord God, to get rid of that and give it to you and not hold on to those stupid things that I try to hold on to. Father God, I pray for each individual that has asked for a uh, prayer request. I think of Desi's back, Lord God. Uh, take a Pastor Mina, Lord God, and what she's going through, and we've prayed for her already. I think of uh, Melody, Lord God, and her situation. I think of Pastor Lori and her family, Lord God her children and grandchildren and family, sisters, brothers, whatever it is. I think about Esther and the children and the grandchildren and Pastor Jim. Lord God, I think of Geneva and her family, Lord. Thank you for deliverance there. I think of each individual, Lord God, that is sitting here today and the concerns and the hurts that are in their hearts, Lord God but the desires and the, that they have and the knowing that by being faithful and obedient, Lord God, that you're going to be there and you're doing something in their lives and you're doing something in their families' lives. So I trust you, Lord God. I trust that you are going to change something in the people that we love and that we care about, that you're going to change something that would draw them closer unto you, Lord God. I don't care if they come to this church or where they go, Lord. That is not a concern of mine. You place them where you need them, Lord. But please draw them, Lord God. I know you're knocking at their heart's door. We hear it all the time. We hear it on ourselves. But I know that they hear that. They hear that draw that you have for them. Let them please step out. And make that first step of making a full commitment unto you, Lord God. Let them not only know about you, but let them really, really know you. And help me to know you better, Father, I pray. Love you, Lord, and I ask you be with us, Lord, as we hear the music and that's coming today, Lord God. And let us praise you and worship you as we should. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, ma'am. We're going to open with uh, Psalm 85. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of of your people and covered all their sins. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together 
Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps.
likes to take a holiday. Everybody likes to take a rest. Spending time together with the family. Sharing lots of love and happiness. Come on. Jesus is now the star divine, brighter 
to you a new song this morning and it's called as we worship you and i just want you to worship the lord this morning and i hope you enjoy this song as we worship you let all the world come and see how the mercy we receive from you can set them as we worship you, let all this joy that fills our hearts bring a hunger and a hope to those who strayed so far. As we bow in adoration and stand in reverent awe, show your majesty and glory, let your Declare your name, Lord Jesus, as the only name who saves. May the power of your salvation fill each heart, we pray. As we worship you, let all the nations hear our song, the song of Jesus and his blood that proved his love for all. As we worship you, may all the lost and broken come. May they hear your still small voice call out their names, each one. As we bow in adoration and stand in reverent awe, show your majesty and let your anointing fall as we declare your name, Lord Jesus, as the only name who saves. May the power of your salvation fill each heart, we pray. As we worship As we bow in adoration and stand in reverent awe, show your majesty and glory, let your anointing fall. As we declare your name, Lord Jesus, as the only name who saves, may the power of
worship through our movements as well as through our hearts. There's something about putting it into action that makes us experience it in a brand new and precious way. Let's worship Christ the King today. Jesus, we thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for all that you are doing in our midst. And we ask that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear so that we would be able to move in accord with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to light the Advent candles again today. This time we get to light two. And would you know that I am deathly afraid of lighters. So I'm going to have to overcome. Go ahead and let's get that video started. We light the candle today of peace. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is eirene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom, and his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others. Like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Hey kids, there is a word that's closely related to peace. Come on up, let's see if we can figure out what it is. And would you guys stand instead of sitting today? Because I need you to hold something else, something up. 
I'm going to give each one of you a piece of paper. Hi. I'm glad to see you guys today. I'm going to give each one of you a piece of paper. I see your stuffy and he's so sweet and snuggly. And your job is to tell me, I have two more for you, but I'm going to wait, okay? Because it, it comes later. I want you to take a look at what you've got, and then I want you to hold it up and tell everybody what it is. Can you turn it around? What is it? Do you need do you need to ask for help from the audience? What is it? Can you hold it up this way? Oh, let me let me uh, let me have you say that again. Chicken noodle soup. Chicken noodle soup. Mm -hmm. And what do you have? What is that? Do you need to ask help from the audience? Ask Connie what that is. Hold it up. What is it? It's a quilt. And a heating pad. Oh, close. Very close. Turn it around. Show it to everybody and ask them to shout out what it is. A hot water bottle. Yeah. I, I thought that would be confusing. Have you ever heard of a hot water bottle? Hmm. And what do you have? A glass of water. Can you turn it around? A glass of water. A glass of water. What do all four of those pictures have in common? What might they give someone? What do you think? Would it help if we added this one? Take a look at that. Would it help if we added that one? What is that? What is that one? People doing what? Like they're feeling alone, like sad. Like, and what's the other person who's not feeling sad doing? She's like trying to cheer her up. She's trying to cheer her up. She's offering, I heard from Richard, what is it? Comfort. Comfort. That word is a word that we are going to use in the sermon today from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort. Comfort my people. Now, it's really important that we know the right way to comfort. Like you wouldn't give a hot water bottle to somebody who'd just broken their arm. Trust me, it would be a very bad idea. And you wouldn't give a quilt to somebody on a very, very hot day, right? You might give chicken noodle soup to somebody who wasn't sick just because it tastes good. But you got to be careful when you're comforting that you're giving the right kind of comfort. For example, hold this one up. Do you know what that is? What is that? Do you know what that is? Children. Hmm. <laughs> hold it up and see if other people can help you. Put it up like this. Huh. It's a judge. Huh. Oh, and we would never judge somebody who needs comfort, would we? So that's the picture of the one that doesn't belong. Hey, you know what some people do when they want comfort? They eat chocolate. And you know what? That's a terrible, terrible substitute for true comfort and true peace. But I was looking for a way today that I might share some chocolate with you. And so it just seemed like a good excuse. Would you like to take a chocolate out of the bag here? This one. Ah, because chocolate with peanut butter is even better. <laughs> You're welcome. Do you want to keep the paper? Okay, <laughs> then I will take it. I'll trade you for chocolate. Good deal? Okay. Thank you so much. I, as always, appreciate your help. And if anybody does want to keep the paper, you're welcome to. All right.
Thank you. Well, we're going to take our offering today in gratitude. My goodness, today was such a day of thanksgiving in our congregation. There were so many words of gratitude and praise shared this morning. Let's thank the Lord for the blessings that he provides for us, that he is always taking care of us, and that somehow there's always enough to go around when we put Jesus first. Lord God, thank you for the gifts that you've blessed us with for the things that you have given to us, for the blessings you have given to us that are not things. And we ask that you would take these gifts, these Christmas gifts we give to you, and multiply them for your service here in this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
the gift of music. It's especially significant during the Christmas season, isn't it? Because all of those songs remind us of the whole story. And we keep in mind the whole story as we celebrate Advent. Well, I want to say, I want to say that I'm very grateful for light today. I am grateful to those who installed a new light in the study. I sat in the study today without hearing any buzzing from fluorescent lights at all. And the sound of silence was so beautiful. <laughs> so thank you for that Christmas present in the office this week. Today we lit the second candle of Advent. Peace, shalom, wholeness, restoring broken things, making all things new. And that is the work of Christmas. Not just an absence of conflict, but the presence of something that is so much more. So um, I'm going to just offer a little bit of excuse making this morning. I have not been myself the last couple of days. And in my pocket, I am carrying some lemon heads just in case. I also have Pastor Jim just in case. Aren't you glad to have Jim and Esther back today? Yeah. Yeah. Me too. So you heard the story about the pastor who always timed his sermons by putting a mint in his mouth and one day he put in a button. <laughs> like, the guy never liked, liked to never stop preaching, so I promise I will not grab a button. <laughs> well, we've been tracking in Advent with the prophets, and today we're going to continue that with the passage from Isaiah 40. Now, not surprisingly... Isaiah 40 comes right after Isaiah 39. <laughs> and I'm not going to win any awards for uh, brilliance or for that observation. But it's really important because in Isaiah 39, the good king, Hezekiah, takes a turn for the bad. And he falls into pride. And he makes friends with Babylon to increase his own reputation. Good King Hezekiah, instead of honoring God for the blessings that God has given him, he becomes a show-off. In his own words, there is nothing among my treasures that I did not show the emissaries of Babylon. And Isaiah ends the first part of the book of Isaiah with this terrible warning in chapter 39, warning of the judgment to come. He says, they are going to carry off your wealth to Babylon and your own children will become eunuchs in the palace of the Babylonian king. Now you'd think, I would think, that if my children were going to become eunuchs at the hands of men... <laughs> that I'd be deeply concerned. Not so with Hezekiah. Sin had gripped his mind and his thoughts were only for himself. And the chapter ends with, good, he says, there will be peace and security in my time without thought for the future. And there the book of Isaiah takes a pause. Some scholars believe that the pause is 40 years, a biblical generation. Others say that this part of the book carrying Isaiah's name was not written until God's people actually had been carried off into Babylon, which was almost 200 years later, fulfilling all of the prophecy that Isaiah had made. And regardless of the way you look at the book of Isaiah, Isaiah, having richly warned of God's judgment, takes this turn in chapter 40. 
towards the themes of reconciliation and grace and mercy and wholeness. The whole tone of the book of Isaiah changes, not because the people heeded his warnings, but in spite, in spite of the fact that they did not change their ways. You see, God would continue to work his plan of redemption even as they suffered the consequences of their hard-headedness. They were kind of known for that throughout history, that hard-headedness. And it's as though Isaiah and the God that Isaiah spoke for resolved to the fact that the people of God would have to learn their lessons the hard way. But God promised that he would be there to eventually bring shalom no matter how broken they became. Let's read from Isaiah chapter 40 this morning. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word? I don't always have us do this, but sometimes it's good. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. (laughs) We're having a tough time. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You may be seated. Father, as we contemplate what you have for us in this passage this morning, open our ears, open our eyes, because we would see Jesus. Amen. So prophecy has always been a little confusing to me, and maybe you're in the same boat. It's hard to say whether a prophecy was for the immediate future of the people that it was spoken to or whether it's for a distant future that applied to the audience that it was spoken to or whether it's for relating the coming of the Messiah or if it's to relate to the coming of the risen King and Savior. And it always seems to be a challenge to me to figure out which is the correct interpretation. And in the case of this passage, it's probably all of the above. You know, (laughs) you know how when you're taking a test and all of the above is one of the answers, (laughs) it's generally the right one? (laughs) Well, it applied... It referred to the comfort that God wanted to give to the people who were exiled to Babylon. And it applied to the comfort that God gave in the gift of the Messiah. And it applies to the full revelation of God when Jesus comes again to fulfill God's redemptive plan. And maybe even it applies to you and I here in this time that we live in to the body of Christ in the context of living out that Christmas peace, living wholeness, restoring broken things. When I visited with our son in Kansas City in April, 
he shared with me the healing that he's found in furniture restoration. He described the physical sense of peace he experiences in that repetitive You know what I'm talking about? That sanding process. Removing the old varnish. And the sense of accomplishment that he gets when those pieces are ready for new varnish. And the anticipation of that first coat drying and how hard it is to give it enough time. And the buffing of that new varnish to a polished gleam. And then the placement of some mid-century modern piece in a renovated home, staging the house for buyers who might be looking at that house as their first home. And we scoured a couple of thrift stores together and considering which broken down bargain pieces could be restored to their created value. And could, which ones could be repurposed into something that was maybe different from their original purpose, was valuable in a brand new way. In short, shalom, restored to wholeness. And I think that God's glory is revealed a little bit every time. Something, someone is returned to their created purpose. I found in the, in the video that we watched, I found that that idea of the wall where all the bricks are in place really spoke to me. I think I've often felt as if I was going through life with a few bricks missing, a few fries short of a happy meal, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not firing on all cylinders or a couple crayons short of a full box. Or in the words of the poet Shel Silverstein, Oh, I'm looking for my missing piece. I'm looking for my missing piece. Heidi ho here I go. Looking for my missing piece. <laughs> and as Advent is a season of reflection and taking time for reviewing, I'm noticing that most of the time when I feel a lack of peace, what I'm really feeling is a missing piece. That I might not have what I need. That I'm not big enough or strong enough or smart enough or rich enough or healthy enough. That something is missing from my ability to face what's being expected of me. And I lose my peace. And I suspect you know what that feels like too, right? So if peace is wholeness, where does that wholeness come from? Well, of course, the Sunday school answer. The Sunday school answer is from the Christ child who became the crucified and resurrected Christ, the Christ who will come again to restore everything. And from the body of Christ that he left to tend his sheep, even the ones with a missing piece. And if wholeness is to be found, at least in part, it's within the body of Christ, present here and now, So can this passage lead us to an understanding of peace in our time? Let's take a look at the words of command that we find in this passage. I'm going to go back. Oh. I'm going to kind of go through it. Comfort. That's not just a noun. That is a Command, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly. That's a command. Speak tenderly. Prepare the way for the Lord. That's a command. Make straight in the wilderness a path, a highway for our God. 
It's interesting that in the original language, each of these commands is issued not to one person, but to y'all. Remember this? To all (laughs) y'all. It's interesting that that's issued to the corporate body. For us in this day, to the body of Christ. This isn't your call or my call. This is our call together. And this is important, especially for those of us who feel a few fries short of a happy meal. It isn't about what I am or am not capable of. It's about how we work together to bring wholeness. It's about how we let others bring their fries to the party, so to speak. So I said I would mention something about Celebrate Recovery. And the launch this week was a really good example of that. Most of you know that Tanya and her whole family have been down with COVID this week. And this program is really Tanya's vision that we're just helping to make happen. And how disappointing it was for her and for the launch group for her to be sick. Talk about a missing piece. But just as we felt the handicaps, God was at work doing something that was nothing short of miraculous in a chain of events that we could not have generated or prepared for. God led us to former leaders of the program. And we met with them on Tuesday night. And on Wednesday morning, that former leader got a call from someone greatly in need of comfort that he had not heard from for years. All those years, and God led that individual to make a call on that particular Wednesday morning. And so those people came along, and they made a comfort connection. And yet another had planned for weeks to start looking for a Celebrate Recovery to attend in the area. And Wednesday became his night. And there were others, too, who heard words of comfort in the testimonies of each other. Now, everything that's part of these groups is confidential, including specifically who does and who does not attend. But within the bounds of that confidentiality, I can share that words of comfort were given that there were tender words spoken, that the way was prepared, and that paths to wholeness were made just a little bit straighter for those folks. Even when we who had planned had no idea how we could carry off that launch with our missing piece, we had no idea. See, this isn't your call or my call or Tanya's call. This is all y'all. This is all y'all in the body of Christ. Speaking the name of Christ to bring comfort, to speak tenderly, to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his paths straight. Every time a prayer request comes across our text messages, I watch as words of comfort are spoken, how tenderly people's concerns are addressed, how people in our church pull together to straighten the path and make a way for the glory of God. And every time we hear of a neighbor in need, we don't ask for them to perform if meeting that need lies in our power. We don't ask them to show up to church in order to prove themselves. We invite them to a place where the comfort of Christ and the glory of God are found. 
but we don't make mercy and grace depend on their actions. We just offer it freely to prepare the way for the Lord. Our actions as individuals does matter, and it would do us good to ask ourselves before speaking, does what I'm saying offer comfort, or does it promote pain? Are my words tender and compassionate, or are they harsh? Do my words prepare the way for this person to be open to Christ? Does this attitude that I'm presenting help overcome barriers to seeing the glory of God? Does it straighten the way for Jesus? Or does it kink and complicate his path? And before we leave today, I want us to consider a little bit more the connection between comfort and peace. How comfort brings wholeness and restores. A friend shared this meme with me this week, and I had a little picture of, to share with you too, but instead I'm just going to say it. Turns out there's no comfort in the bottom of this tub of ice cream. But the important thing is, I try. And it's funny because we often find ourselves looking for comfort in the times that we lack peace. And we look for it in all the wrong places like chocolate or ice cream or other substances. We look for it in all the wrong places because we're scared that others will let us down and will complicate our path instead of helping to make it straight. And we're often scared with good reason. We've been hurt by those who should be our comforters. And if that's you, and if you've been hurt by God's people, in the spirit of Advent, I lament that. And in the spirit of Advent, I repent of the times that I have been insensitive. And I know that here in this crowd, we vow to try to be people of Isaiah 40 and not people of Isaiah 39. We vow to try to bring wholeness and restoration where you've been without peace if you have been hurt by the people of God. There's another passage from Isaiah that often finds its way into our Christmas cards. The lion will lie down with the lamb, and a little child will lead them. I could tell you a story here, but in this case, I think seeing is believing. Can you guys run that video? Let's watch as this little child leads us. Can we reload it? We'll be patient. This is so powerful. I don't want to just tell this story. I want you to see it. Mm, gotta see it. Yeah. I say silent prayers for technology very frequently. <laughs> What do we think? <laughs> Connie says talk. Talk more. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything more to say. <laughs> it 
We'll try one more time, and then we will just play the sound. And you'll have to just imagine it in your mind's eye. But I really wanted to share this with you this morning. Maybe as we're waiting, you can think about a time when you have felt comforted and what was involved in that, how you were comforted, who comforted you, what impact did it have on your life? Nope. Okay. Let's just play the... So, I think um, me and my wife were looking at some... So, um, me and my wife were looking at some old home videos recently of our youngest daughter being born. I'm going to show you the video. Not her being born, because my wife would be like, you doing what? <laughs> we got some conflict we need to talk about. So, it's a video of our youngest daughter being born. I took this video. The video you're about to watch is a video I took, but I didn't understand the power of it until I watched the video. So let me set it up for you. She's like two and a half minutes old. Our daughter's two and a half minutes old at the time. And um, they got her under that little chicken warmer at the hospital, the little <laughs> thing to keep the french fries warm. I don't know what kind of insurance we have, but that's what they got her under. And the nurse is about to clean her up, and she starts to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. It's okay. I'm right here. I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. Right here. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay, baby. Yo, so that was pretty powerful, right? Now, now it's like seven, seven and a half minutes or so later. The nurse is done cleaning her up, and she starts to cry again. I speak up, and she stops crying again. But I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love and she you. opens her eyes. Yeah, and I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. So here's the thing. There's going to be times in life where it feels like you're going from conflict to conflict to conflict. Or maybe you're just full of fear because of all the uncertainties right now. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice. Be still and listen for the Father's voice because He is talking to you. And what He wants you to know is that He's right here. He loves you. All you have to do is open your eyes. All you have to do is open your eyes. Maybe some of us feel a special need for comfort today. And maybe some of us need to hear peace spoken to our souls. There's never space for judgment in the comfort process. There's only room for God's love. If we are to see the glory of God, it will be because we are people who speak peace to the souls of those who are hurting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that we are wounded people, all of us. But by your stripes, we are healed, as Isaiah told us. 
And we pray, Lord, that where there is a need for comfort, that you will send ministering angels in the form of human beings to speak peace in this holiday season. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son to make the ultimate peace between God and humanity. And thank you, Lord, that a little child can lead us to your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand for a blessing. May you find yourselves this week in a position to receive comfort and in a position to give comfort and eyes and ears to know that God himself loves you and wants to bring comfort to your spirit in all those places that feel broken and wholeness to your life. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord today.